join our voices with our call to worship from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's sing Blessed Assurance. <clears throat> is mine over the foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation purchase of God born of his spirit washed in his blood this is my story refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble, and that we have that blessed assurance that in submission to you, all is at rest. We, in you, our Savior, are happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with your goodness, lost in your love. Together we pray these words this morning that you meet us where we are from Psalm 42. Heavenly Father, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Amen. Welcome to worship at the Williamsburg Community Chapel. I'm so grateful that you've joined us today as we continue to fix our eyes on Jesus with our doubt. As always, we are seeking to connect more deeply with you and give you opportunities to connect more deeply with Christ and others here at our church. And there are three opportunities I invite you to consider joining us in this coming week. The first is this Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock, we will be hosting the first of several Popsicle and Praise Nights. These events are geared towards families with children who are pre-K through elementary school aged, and this will be a great evening of fun and connection. We will have some worship, some teaching, and of course, some sweet frozen treats for you and your family to enjoy. So I hope that you will come and join us this Tuesday evening for our Popsicles and Praise Night. The next opportunity for you to consider is a small group. We really believe that our relational God has created us to enjoy and grow in relationships with one another. 
And if you are not currently experiencing the benefits of biblical community through a small group, I highly encourage you to sign up to join one. You can do so by either visiting our website at wcchapel.org groups, or you can contact Dale South, our small groups pastor, directly at dsouth at wcchapel.org, and he would love to help you connect with others in a small group community. The final opportunity to consider is happening one week from today. We are returning to our chapel family conversations. Next Sunday, April 25th at 5 o'clock, we will have one of those conversations under the tent. And this is an informal opportunity for you to join lead pastor Travis Simone and ask him any questions you have, as well as share any feedback that you have. This will be happening outside as well as online if you can't join us in person. And I hope that you will come and join us for our next Chapel Family Conversation next Sunday at 5 o'clock. Now, I invite you, as we turn to a moment of prayer in our service, to pray with me together the words that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray the Lord's Prayer now together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Behold the broken world we pray where want and war increase and grant us Lord in this our day the ancient dream of peace a dream of soul to sickles bend, of spears to scythe and spade, the weapons of our warfare spent, a world of peace remain. Take a moment now to give back to God who has given everything for us, who brings that peace in our hearts and will ultimately bring it to a new heaven and a new earth. Please visit wcchapel.org as we do so. Wonderful day. 
scripture reading today comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has a spirit that makes him mute, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse. So most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? 
And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first day back from spring break can be a tough one. I'm sure you can identify with that, right? That after seven days with no alarm clock or text messages or calendar alerts, all of a sudden, real life hits home. It's a gear shift. It can be a grind. That first day back from vacation can be a tough day. Often, Susie and I like to leave sort of a buffer day between vacation and that real life experience. A day to slowly gear back up for school and work and all that life has to bring. And so as we left our spring break destination to head home a a day earlier than we needed to, we knew we wanted to ease back into real life. But as we drove home, my youngest son got car sick. I mean, he's gotten car sick before, but this was really bad. Tucker was throwing up for six hours. Six hours. It was horrible. And as Tucker continued to throw up into that Tostitos chip bag that was supposed to be our snack for the car ride home, Susie and I turned to each other. We just said, I guess we're not on vacation anymore. It was like that mountaintop experience of vacation quickly down to the deep valley of real life. It was tough. That first day back... That drive home, it's a wild ride. I think in Mark chapter 9, we experience this this same contrast. We experience this same gear shift, not so much from a vacation back to everyday life, but a mountaintop, literal mountaintop spiritual experience, a spiritual high into a valley low. You see, as Mark chapter 9 begins, Jesus and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, are on a high mountain, Mark tells us. And while they're up there, Jesus' body is transfigured. We call it the Mount of Transfiguration because Jesus' body begins to emanate, radiate light, His clothes, Mark says, are are whiter than any bleach on earth could make them. The glory of God shining through him. It was incredible. And it wasn't just that, but then Moses and Elijah showed up. And then God's presence in a cloud, just like it did on Mount Sinai in the Old Testament, shows up. And the power of God is all around them. And God's voice speaks. And he says over Jesus, This is my son. My beloved son. Listen to him. And as quickly as this all came, it goes away. But can you imagine for a minute what that must have been like? Can you imagine what that must have been like for Peter, James, and John? There on top of this mountain, the glory of God shining in Jesus. And they didn't die. See, whenever God's presence showed up in the Old Testament, God would shield his people lest they die. But James and Peter and John, they experienced the glory of God. The love of the Father and the Son together. They experience the wonder and power and presence of God on this mountain. And they live to tell about it. What an incredible mountain top experience. What an incredible time of worship together. But then they walk down the mountain. They walk down the mountain into the valley. And it's not just any valley. It's a valley of pain. It's a valley of division. It's a valley of 
arguing and evil and loss. It's a horrible valley. I mean, it's a, it's a literal valley, but, but Mark wants us to see that just like it was a literal mountaintop, it was a spiritual mountaintop, that this valley is not just a valley, but a spiritual valley. And it's here, deep in this valley of pain and evil and sickness and death and division, that Mark wants to teach us something about faith. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because when we're on the mountain, when we feel as though we are experiencing the presence of God, faith seems easy. But when we're down in the valley, that's when our faith is tested. That's when we have our doubts that's when our questions arise. That's when faith is harder. Have you experienced these valleys? Maybe you lost a loved one. Maybe you are experiencing the effects of death or disease or sickness in yourself or someone you love. Maybe it's the consequence of sin, your sin, or somebody else's sin, and it has created the muck and the destruction that sin creates. Maybe there's been relational breakdown. Maybe horrible things have happened. You're in a valley, and in a valley we experience doubt. We experience questions. We experience unbelief. And Mark wants us to know something. Mark wants us to know something incredible. See, Mark wants to tell us that our perfect God meets us in our imperfect faith. That when we're in the valley, our perfect God meets us in our imperfect faith. It's incredible. You see, Jesus and James and Peter and John, they, they come down from the mountaintop and they descend into the valley. The disciples and the scribes, they're arguing and fighting. There's tension and chaos. And there's one character that we meet because Jesus says, hey, what is going on? What are you guys fighting about? And a man steps forward, the father of a child. And he says, I've brought my son to be healed. He, he's burdened by a spirit, a spirit that casts him down, that causes him to quake and to go rigid and to foam at the mouth and grind his teeth. The spirit has made him deaf and, and mute. Please, I brought him here for your disciples to heal, but they could not heal him. And Jesus goes, how long do I have to deal with this faithless generation? He says, bring the boy to me. And they bring the boy to Jesus. And when the, the spirit encounters Jesus, he once again throws the boy to the ground and puts him into one of these fits. And Jesus turns to the father and says, how long has this been happening? And the boy's father says, it's, it's happened since childhood. It's tried to destroy my son more times than I can count. It throws him into fire. It throws him into water. You can hear the father's desperation. You can hear the father's pain and exhaustion. The father is in the valley. And the father says, if you can, Jesus... Will you show compassion on us? Will you help us? And Jesus says, If? If I can? Yeah, Jesus says, If I can? No, no, let me tell you something. This is a, not a matter of if I can help you. It's not even a matter of if I want to help you. No, no, this is a matter of faith. 
And Jesus says, all things are possible for one who believes. All things are possible for one who has faith. Jesus does something incredible in this moment. See, Jesus could have said all sorts of things right there. Jesus could have said, sure, I'll help, but go and, and make yourself right. Make yourself holy. Give sacrifices at the temple. Give burnt offerings. Make yourself pure and clean, and then I'll help you. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says that the bridge between God's power and, and the pain of man is not our righteousness or our holiness or a secret code or a special offering, but faith. It's what he said to the Roman centurion just a few chapters earlier, whose daughter was dying. He said, don't be afraid, but have faith. It's what he said to the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years that reached out and touched his garment. He said, your faith has healed you. Yes, Jesus says that the, the bridge between you and me is not somehow something that you can do, but is faith in me. Jesus says all things are possible for the one who has faith. But the Father knows something. The Father knows that he's not filled with faith. The Father knows that he has doubts and unbelief and questions and all these things swirling in his brain. But when Jesus says all things are possible for he who believes, the father cries out, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. The father says, I believe, but I do have doubts. I believe, but I, I, I don't really 100% sure. He says, I believe, but I don't really know believe. Help me in my unbelief. And Jesus does something incredible. Jesus heals his son. Literally, the text says, Jesus resurrects his son. See, Mark wants us to know something. Jesus wants us to know something. That our perfect God meets us in our imperfect faith. That when we are in the valley, when we have doubts and questions, our perfect God meets us in our imperfect faith. It's incredible. But if we thought that was the only thing we could learn from this father, we'd be wrong. Because I think there's another question we can ask in this story. You see, I want to ask the question is, how do we show faith? How do we express our faith when we're in the valley? What does faith in the valley look like? And I think the father tells us. First, faith in the valley is honest. Faith in the valley is honest. The Father doesn't pretend to have it all together. And Jesus doesn't need him to. The Father doesn't pretend to be living perfectly. And Jesus doesn't need him to. The Father doesn't pretend to have perfect faith. And Jesus doesn't need him too because our perfect father our perfect god meets us in our imperfect faith and so the father says i believe but help me in my unbelief faith is a gift from god and we can try to muster it up ourselves. And we can try to convince ourselves that we have it all. But Jesus wants us to be honest. And the Father was honest. And Jesus responded. Because our perfect God meets us in our imperfect faith. And faith 
in the valley is honest, but faith in the valley is also about surrender. Notice something incredible here that the father does. I, I would imagine as a father myself, the most precious thing that that father has is his son. The most precious thing this father has is his child. He has his whole life tried to keep this spirit from destroying this child. He has used all of his energy and effort to rescue his son, to keep his son safe. And the only way for him to truly do it is to surrender even his son to Jesus. To give him, give Jesus the most precious thing he has and say, Jesus, I trust you. We can be honest in our doubts and in our disbelief. But at the end of the day, we need to surrender to the God who gives us faith. We need to surrender to the perfect God who meets us in our imperfect faith and to give him all that we have and all that we are. And the scary thing is, is that when we surrender to God, it doesn't necessarily get easier right away. It doesn't, there's no promise that everything gets better. In fact, notice in this story, as, as Jesus uh, commands this evil spirit to leave this boy, he, he shakes the boy violently, and the spirit causes the boy to have this fit once again. And as the spirit leaves him, the boy is left for dead. The crowd says, look, Jesus has killed the boy. I wonder if the father thinks, Oh, he was deaf and mute, Jesus, but at least he was alive. What have you done? But faith in the valley means we surrender to God. On top of the mountain, as God enveloped the three disciples, he spoke over Jesus and said, This is my son. Listen to him. Faith in the valley means that we're honest. And faith in the valley means that we surrender all that we are and all that we have to the one who can indeed rescue us. But faith in the valley also means that we worship, that we keep worshiping God. There's lots of reactions to what's happening to the sun. As the son lays there as though he's dead, the crowd says, look, Jesus has killed him. The disciples are big, busy arguing why they couldn't help the son themselves. The father is confused of what's going on. But I wonder, I wonder what Peter and James and John are thinking in that moment. Remember, they were on the mountaintop with Jesus. They had experienced the glory of God And I wonder, I just wonder if they said to themselves, no, wait, we've seen the glory of God. I can't wait to see what Jesus does. You see, in worship, we experience God. And in the valley, we need not to just know and understand the glory of God, but we need to have experienced it ourselves I mean, we understand this, right? I, I've been told my whole life that the Grand Canyon is beautiful. I've seen pictures of the Grand Canyon. I've been told it's incredible. But everyone that I talk to that goes to the Grand Canyon says, you have to see it to believe it. You have to experience it yourself. It's better than any picture or any imagination could do. That happened with me with the Northern Lights. My whole life, I was told that the Aurora Borealis was beautiful, incredible, awesome. But when I saw it myself, when I experienced it firsthand, I truly understood its power. You see, in worship, we experience the glory of God. In worship, we understand and experience the love and power and presence of God in ways that we can only do on the mountain. And we need those experiences 
in the valley. Because in the valley, we can't just know that Jesus will save us. We need to have experienced the power of God firsthand. And so we worship together. We show up on Sundays for many mountaintop experiences where we can experience God together and move through our valleys together. You see, a perfect God meets us in our imperfect faith. And when we're in valleys, our faith needs to be honest. But we need to surrender. We need to worship. You know, when we were in our car driving back from spring break and, and Tucker just kept throwing up, I kept saying to Tucker, we can stop, buddy. We, we can stop at a rest stop. We can go to a hotel for the night. We can, we can do whatever you need to. And Tucker just kept saying, no, Dad, just get me home. No, Dad, I, I just want to be home. Just get me home. You know, Jesus meets us in our imperfect faith. But he doesn't just meet us. He gets us home. He gets us back to the mountain. See, Jesus doesn't just meet us in our imperfect faith. But he's walked the valley for us. He's walked the ultimate valley. The valley of death. And on the cross, he took our sin and our shame, our doubts and our disbelief, and he brought them all to the grave. And three days later, he rose to life so that we can have life in him. That even when we in our, in our darkest, deepest valleys, we can trust that one day we will be home with him. Our perfect God meets us in our imperfect faith. May we consider that truth together as we are honest, as we surrender, and as we worship together, even as we do. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. He saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. But by him at such a Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at last. He will hold me fast. 
if you find yourself in a valley today, you find yourself uh, doubting, questioning, wondering about faith, um, don't be alone. Reach out. We would love to be on this journey with you. You can go online to our chapel website. You can call the church office. You can email any of us on staff. We would love to be with you. We'd love to be praying for you and with you and walking alongside you together. But as we go this morning, may we be encouraged and remember that our perfect God meets us in our imperfect faith. Go in peace. Thank you.